Good morning, folks. Welcome back to the Food for the Faithful channel with me, Bill Reimer, your reluctant prophet. I invite you to fulfill the biblical adjunct of what must happen to false prophets, to murder them, or execute them, by death by stoning. Go back into my previous vodcasts and look for inaccuracies. If you find any, please come and stone me. I'll give you my address. But on today's topic, we're going to discuss why my fellow Canadians are being so lax in assuming responsibility for the thing, things that they themselves must be responsible for, namely to assure that our elected representatives and the, those whom they appoint, namely the bureaucracy, bureaucracy are governing us responsibly. The radical left is driven by pathological narcissism, envy, and laziness. That is a given. But what bothers me most is that this mindset has taken over a significant percentage of the population we have become lax and unthinking. How did this happen? For this languor of mind and body was certainly not indicative of the Canada of my youth. So what is the cause of the willful blindness of so many of my fellow Canadians? It took 30 years to begin to retire the debt Pierre Elliott Trudeau's disastrous government created, and it will take 10 times that to retire the debt created by his son's malignant anti-energy policies and the cost of maintaining a metastasizing bureaucracy used to enforce his government's illiberal authoritarian hold over us. Canadians appear to be utterly determined never to learn from history, dedicated to remaining completely indifferent to the necessity of fiduciary accountability, turn a blind eye to sound economic policies and choose to remain utterly ignorant of how a constitutional democracy under parliamentary oversight must operate. Therefore, obviously, there can be no political solution to that moral, philosophical, and spiritual crisis created by a dumbed-down generation of voters who refuse to recognize that the political class caused this dilemma and therefore cannot possibly solve solve the very issues that they're create, they created. What is the source of this mental pathogen? All bad ideas are French. It's an absolute principle of human existence. Dr. David Starkey. England did not know feudalism until the Norman invasion of 1066. Until that time, its nobility and kings had governed by consent of Witten which was the Anglo-Saxon version of Parliament. A thousand years ago, in one fell swoop, the French Normans gutted responsible government in England to create, a mur to create a murderous tyranny. Today, our parliamentary democracy has been utterly corrupted by an oligarchical element from the Laurentian region of Canada. And so, the wheel has come full circle, which only proves Dr. Starkey's assertion. This is why I so often mention the Laurentian elite who have held the nation in a vice grip of faux enlightened tyranny for decades. From an article written by John Weissenberger in the National Post, published December the 5th, 2019, entitled Meet the Laurentian Elite, the Mediocre Masters of Canada, our self-declared social and political elite is like the air we breathe or the proverbial water around fish. It seems so natural as to be unnoticeable. Journalist and author John Ibbotson coined the term in a seminal 2011 article, later expanded into a book, The Big Shift. He defined the Laurentians as the political, academic, cultural, media, and business elites of central Canada. Ibbotson and co-author Daryl Bricker argued that the 2011 federal conservative majority achieved via the alignment of Western Canada 
in ex-urban Ontario represented a major rearrangement of our political landscape. Subsequent events, however, suggest that if a shift is happening, it may be long and painful. Ibbots and Sites and Credits, the historical accomplishment of Central Canada's elites, from the national policy and the St. Lawrence Seaway to what he terms the national social security system. He is unduly kind. Beginning in 1968, coincident with the election of Pierre Trudeau, our elites adopted contemporary left-leaning economic and social policies. Federal government spending mushroomed from 16% of the economy in 1967 to 25% of a much larger pie in 1984 when Trudeau Sr. departed. A vast increase in dollar terms. Simultaneously, the Canadian public sector became almost 50% of the economy, with the programs implemented in institutions created almost too numerous to mention. This is the point. A robust civil society and private sector economy were being supplanted by an expanding state. The reckoning came in the 1990s. Canada's debt to GDP ratio approached 72%. And in 1995, the Wall Street Journal called us an honorary third world country. After two credit rating downgrades and prodded prodded by the decidedly non-Laurentian Reform Party, the Liberals acted. Laurentian patriarchs Paul Martin and Jean Chrétien also are credited with writing Canada's finances. But who cast us into the pit in the first place? For decades, the Laurentian elite grappled with an existential crisis, Quebec separatism, Confederation was, in their view, a compact between two founding peoples that would be blown apart if Quebec left. Shockingly, Laurentian Canada's brokerage parties had no visceral understanding of the true believing separatists who viewed each federal concession as an incremental independence. So, we had our near-death experience in 1995, allegedly slaved saved only by money and the ethnic vote, to quote PQ leader Jacques Parizeau. Over confident Federalist leaders, Laurentians all fairly sleepwalked through the campaign until they realized at the 11th hour that Quebecers may actually vote to leave. A shaken Chrétien gave a pleading address five days before the vote and interviewed years later, senior liberal cabinet ministers still resembled deer in the headlights in contemplating the unthinkable. Of course, Perizzo, Perizzo's people had a detailed implementation plan ready to launch upon a favorable result. Using the twin yardsticks of fiscal management and national unity, the Laurentian elite's tenure over the past 50 years has ranged from poor to passable. As the Laurentians presided their worldview, Ibbotson's Laurentian consensus ruled. Lack of competition from a rival elite or elites, except of course the separatists, who saw and we saw how that turned out, increased their torpor and complacency. This, coupled with an increasingly arrogant detachment from many ordinary Canadians, Canadians just like me, particularly those outside Central Canada, caused repeated social and political rifts. Historically, the Laurentian elite were Upper Canadian Anglo-Protestants and Quebecois patricians, and their descendants still dominate the upper strata of politics, the bureaucracy, crown corporations and agencies, academia and media. Private sector membership tends toward legacy industries, particularly banking and finance and manufacturing, often dominated by multi-generational families. The media, particularly the CBC, protect 
the consensus across the country. As Diane Francis has observed, the elite's members have remarkable mobility among the upper levels of Canada's government, business, and the bureaucracy. Today's Laurentian elite is also arguably our franchise of the mobile transnational professional class. The anywheres, as discussed in Stever's, Stephen Harper's 2018 book, right here, right now. They are, according to Harper, urban and in university educa educated professionals who have become genuinely globally oriented in their careers and professional lives. As anywheres, the Laurentians largely reflect the universal, broadly leftist monoculture. Their personal ethos is typically secular and socially progressive. Today, this includes much of the postmodern canon, intersectionality, quantifying privilege, and the seemingly incessant signaling of virtue. Economically, they range from socialist to corporatist businessmen who actively seek advantage from deals with the government while typically promoting the social progressive agenda. Adopting globalism may actually have diluted the Laurentian nature of the class and boosted their disdain for national character. This may explain Justin Trudeau's comment in New York Times, there is no core identity, no mainstream in Canada. Perhaps a riff on Paul Martin's Country of Minorities or Yann Martel's Canada as the greatest hotel on earth. Further on in this article, Weissenberg states, the West now comprises almost a third of Canada's population. The Laurentian's response to shifting population and money has been restrictive, envious, and resentful, with ignorance and neglect replaced by targeted aggression. Under a cloak of green, the federal liberals have written one generally supportive rule book for economic development in the East and a decidedly unfriendly one, including the West Coast oil tanker ban and Bill C-69, the No More Pipelines Bill for the West. The burning question is whether the Laurentian elite is confusing short-term tactical gain with strategic accomplishment. Is it really to the elite's fundamental and long-term benefit to beggar the region that supplies the lion's share of financial lubricant that powers the nation? The past several years show that despite its electoral success, the Laurentian elite simply does not possess the life experience to manage current regional tensions and basic national affairs. End of quote from that article by Weissenberger. And back to my thoughts, my final thoughts. Personally, I'm with Shirkagor when it comes to recognizing the hilarity of the human contradictions the greatest of which lies ultimately in the powerlessness of the powerful in spite of all their vain boasting of creating some, some future progressive utopia by means of hubristic social engineering and pipe dreams which are based upon unworkable renewable energy that is no cleaner than the fossil fuels that the elite refuse to mine. Add to this the absolute assurance that we are approaching a singularity or mankind will create a technology that may well, we may well not be able to control, which could destroy both God's creation along with the technology's creators. So, our highest genius of creating artificial intelligence thus may well become our lowest folly. This is true comedy, where God laughs because we dared to tell him our plans and how we will set about altering the sum and substance of his creation, trifling with the very structure of reality itself, only to be destroyed by the idolatrous nature of our own godless creation. And my fellow Canadians, 
You have abandoned your God-given intelligence by refusing to recognize that the elite you have entrusted to govern you are incapable of governing. Now, if these aren't some things to think and pray about on this day, when we this nation faces a crisis that was so easily predictable and so long in the planning, I am gobsmacked. that you have paid so little attention. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.